There was a, a few years ago, I believe it was three or four years ago, where I had a, a sabbatical from the church, which is a couple months where I'm able to kind of step away from responsibilities, do a little bit of rest and relaxation to recharge. And one of the things that I decided to kind of help keep myself busy and be useful at the same time around my wife and I, the summer before, had just purchased a home. And so I took on the task of renovating a half bathroom that's on our upstairs level. All right. I think the bathroom was built in the 70s and I wasn't sure which was worse, the wallpaper, the yellow tile, or the matching yellow toilet to the yellow tile. But either way, it was like, okay, this is now 50 years old. It's time to freshen this up a little bit. Now, I have very little handyman skills, but I had two things. I had time and I had YouTube. And time and YouTube and a man can be a dangerous combination because you can find a way to do almost anything on there. And so I took it to myself to, to go ahead and to start doing it. And so I was, you know, taking wallpaper off is pretty easy. Taking some things out, um, you know, it was just a half bath, so I didn't have to do shower or anything like that. And then I got to the point where I, I think I was trying to take out the vanity that was there. And I was trying to disconnect the water hoses and, and the, the drain that was underneath. And I was using what I had at my house, which is just a simple wrench. And it was kind of down and it was like underneath and it was a hard angle. And no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get it to budge. I could not, and of course, being a man, I'm like, I'm not going to Home Depot. I'm sitting here for as long as, this. after like a half hour, I was like, this isn't getting any better, right? So I had to do what I hate to do, right? When you're in the middle of a project, you're like, oh, I got to go leave, go to the store, get something else. But I ran to the store, talked to the guy, and he's like, oh, you need a pair of channel lock pliers. Yeah, yeah, got the, got the good thing, the good stuff, right? Pay $10, $15 for a tool, go home, clamp it on there. I'm like, I hardly even had to put any pressure right off. I'm like, wow, it's amazing. See, it's amazing what the right tool will do for the right thing. What the right tool will do, and you can try all you want. I put all the effort that I had, but I had the wrong tool, and it didn't matter how hard I tried. It wasn't the effort that mattered. It was the fact that I was using the wrong tool for the job. Well, we talked about last week as we started this new series called The Armor of God, that we are in a spiritual battle, a spiritual battle. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians chapter 6. If you're using one of the Bibles that's in the, the pew in front of you, one of the blue Bibles, it's on page 979. It's near the back of your Bible, Ephesians chapter 6. And last week, we, we jumped into this text, and, and it, was, it said how we don't wrestle just against flesh and blood, the things that we see, but, but against principalities and powers. And we talked about how whether we realize it or not, whether we think about it or not, each and every one of us is engaged in a spiritual battle, in a spiritual battle. And we were told though that last week that we are armed by God. God gives us his armor with the armor of God that we can stand firm. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you don't need to shrink back in fear to this spiritual battle that's going on. But the command for us, which was given four times in this passage, three last week, and it's the first word of our passage tonight, is to stand firm, to stand firm and tonight we're going to look at the passage that is the main passage kind of in the center here, giving us the tools that we need to fight the spiritual battle we're in. Or the weapons that God equips us with as followers of Jesus Christ, that if we want to engage in warfare the way that God has given it to us, these are the things that we should pay attention to in our lives. And so Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14 says this, Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. 
Now, Paul gives us here six weapons that we have for spiritual warfare. And our outline tonight will be fairly simple as we walk through and think about the significance of each of these weapons. But what I do want us to make sure of is that we, we don't try and read too much into certain things. Sometimes as you read through certain people, they're like, well, if it's a belt, then it must mean this because it must mean this and belts function this way. Because this idea of armor is just used throughout Scripture. We're going to look at a lot of Old Testament references. And it's used in the New Testament as well. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says this in verse 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, if you're paying attention, the breastplate in 1 Thessalonians is different than the one in Ephesians. And we should say, that's okay. Because the point isn't that righteousness is like a breastplate and love is like this and faith always has to be a shield. But here, the point is that it's the armor. It's the idea of of being ready. So we don't want to read too much into these metaphors, but we want to get an idea as to what what these passages are talking about and what, what Paul would envision for us with these weapons that God gives us. And so the first weapon is seen there in verse 14. And somebody says, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. The first weapon that we have as a follower of Jesus Christ in spiritual warfare is we have the truth. God gives us the truth, meaning the truth of the gospel revealed in Jesus Christ that we have to arm ourselves with to fight the spiritual battle that we find ourselves in. Paul uses this idea of a belt from imagery from the Old Testament. And so in the book of Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah chapter 11, verse 5, it says this, Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. And this is an image of the Messiah, Jesus who was to come, arming himself with righteousness and truth as a belt. If you remember, I think it's in the uh, the King James translation. This is where it says, gird your loins. You don't hear words like that anymore in 2020, right? To gird your loins. It's this idea that as someone would would back there, they wouldn't be wearing pants, but they would have a flowing robe. And so if they were just to take off running, it would be very easy to literally just trip over your clothes. And so they would scoop up their clothes and then tighten their belt around it. So then they were equipped and they had freedom of movement. They were prepared for it. This idea of truth being a weapon that God gives us, truth plays a key role throughout the entire book of Ephesians. It's the truth of God that's revealed in the gospel and also the truth then which affects our lives. Just two chapters earlier, speaking of the truth in Ephesians chapter 4, he says this, But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. See, the truth of God's word, the truth of the gospel in our lives is key in fighting spiritual warfare. Why? Because Satan is the father of lies. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the God you serve, God is the God of truth and your enemy is the father of lies. And we need the truth of the gospel, the truth of God's word to combat the lies that Satan would attack us with. If you were here last week, we talked about how often spiritual warfare works in our lives is that when we've been hurt, when we've been wounded, that our hearts are fertile territory, either for good or for bad. And in our wounding, what often the next step is, is that lies will come into our minds. Lies will come into our hearts. And it's important, especially when we're in pain, when we start to think about ourselves, when we start to think about God, when we start to think about the people around us. Are we believing what God says to be true or are we believing what Satan is claiming to be true but is actually a lie? 
See, when we're in spiritual warfare, we need to focus on what is true. We need to focus on what is true. And oftentimes, when we are under attack, we focus so much on our feelings and emotions and not on what we know to be true of God's word. When we are under spiritual attack, it's easy to respond with just how we feel and not what we know to be true. If I'm honest, I think there's been times in my life, especially difficult times, where I didn't feel like God was with me. I didn't feel like God was with me. I don't know if that's shocking as a pastor, if you hear that or not, but like pastors don't always wake up and are like, oh, Jesus is right here with me today. This is, no, that's, that's not my life. Maybe some other pastors, but not any ones I've met. I have woken up a lot of days in my life and I haven't felt that God was with me. There's been a lot of circumstances in my life where I haven't felt like God was in control. It seems like I'm flying down the highway trying to hit the brakes of life and it just keeps getting faster. And I'm saying, what is going on? And I don't feel sometimes like God is in control. But what do I do when I don't feel like God's with me? What do I do when I don't feel like God's in control? I go back to the truth of God's word. See, even when I'm under attack and life is going like that and I don't feel it, I need to remind my feelings of what God's word tells me is true. And in spiritual warfare, we fight from the truth of God's word. And that's why even when we feel alone and abandoned, we remind ourselves that God is with us. When we feel like our lives are out of control, we're reminded that God is still in control. And so we focus not just on feelings, but on the truth of the gospel, the truth of God's word. The second weapon that God gives us is there also in verse 14. It says his second part is having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. The second weapon is simply that, it's righteousness. The second weapon you have is righteousness. Again, Paul is here referencing back to the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah chapter 59, verse 17, which says this. Can we have it up on the screen, please? There we go. It says this. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Another passage looking forward to the Messiah to which Paul references here, again, the breastplate of righteousness. The thing we need to think about is if we are equipped with righteousness. Whose righteousness is it that we are using? Is it our own? Is it our own good deeds? Is that what we have to rely on in our spiritual battle? The answer is no. The breastplate of righteousness that we put on is the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself. It says in in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that he who knew no sin became sin for us that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, when God looks at you, no matter how messed up your life is, what Jesus sees isn't your sin. What what God sees is Jesus' righteousness on your behalf. And that righteousness that we receive from God puts us in right spiritual standing before God so we can withstand the attack of the enemy. See, so much of the spiritual battle we're in isn't just about actions that we live out, but it's about our identity and how we think about our very self. So much of our spiritual battle is about remembering that we are new in Christ Jesus, that we have been set apart and are righteous before him. This last weekend on Friday night, uh, my wife and I, just two nights ago, we went up to Milwaukee because we missed it when it was here. But the Lion King Broadway play was in Milwaukee for the last month. I loved the movie growing up. I had never seen the play. Somehow I missed it when it was in Chicago a couple years ago. So we went on up there on Friday night and watched the play. It was an amazing play, costumes, music, the whole thing was so much fun. But if you remember the story of the Lion King, either from the Disney movie or you've gone and seen the play... Remember, it's about the story of a lion, a little lion named Simba, who grows up. His father dies when he's young. He blames himself, and so he runs away and kind of abandons the life that he had beforehand. And there's this pivotal scene 
when, when he kind of has like a vision, let's not get too, right? It's just a movie, right? It's a, it's a Disney movie. We don't need to get reading into it very far. But the scene where his father from death speaks to him and it's just three words to him. Remember, is it three? No, four, sorry. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. It wasn't that he needed to change his actions, but what he needed to do first was remember who he was. And for him, he was the son of the king, and now he was the rightful king. As followers of Jesus, so much in the spiritual battle we face, if we just did four, those four words, it would help us so much. If we simply remembered who we are in Jesus Christ. If you, in your spiritual battle, stop and remember who you are, that you have now been made righteous before God. See, Satan would love for you to forget who you are in Jesus Christ. He would love for us to think that we're unlovable, that we're useless, that we have no worth, no talents, no abilities to render to anyone or to God's glory. But when we remember who we are, that we have put on the breastplate of righteousness and we stand before God righteous, it helps us in our battle that we are in. Verse 15 says this, And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel. The third weapon there is readiness. Is readiness that we have in this world. Again, this idea of putting on shoes and equipping ourselves with shoes, again, references back to the book of Isaiah, chapter 52. It says this, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvations, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And Ephesians talks a lot about peace. In fact, peace is probably the main theme of the entire second chapter of the book of Ephesians. And what he's saying is, is how, does, how does being ready for having peace, how does that change our lives? Well, it means this. First, it's this understanding that we have peace in two ways if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. First, you have peace with God. You living out now have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. But then second part of that, the whole second half of Ephesians chapter 2, is because we have peace with God, we are to live at peace with others. And he goes after then the great racial divides of their times, Jew and Gentile. And he says, all those things that used to separate you are now brought down and you have peace in Jesus Christ. When we think about what it looks like to be ready to be people of peace, I want us to be thinking of this, that we should be quick to live and practice to others the peace that we experience to God. That as followers of Jesus Christ, we should always be prepared to make peace with the people around us. Because God's word tells us that one of the best representations of the gospel in our world is the unity of the church. And so what is Satan after to divide? He's after to divide the church. He would love for the church to not be united, to not be seeking peace, but rather to be pulled apart, that we wouldn't be ready to seek peace with each other. But as followers of Jesus Christ, in the battle that we are in, we need to decide beforehand that nothing that comes could break our peace that we experience with the people around us. We're going to talk about this, I think, a lot more in the next six to eight months But I don't know if you realize it, but Tuesday of this week is Super Tuesday. And I know sometimes you're like, oh my goodness, he's talking politics at church. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, all right? That's up to you. But here's the thing. It will seem, based on what you see in the news, based on how candidates will interact with each other, based on what you read on Twitter and on Facebook, that it's impossible to have peace if we are in different political camps. And Satan would love for nothing more than this upcoming election season to divide believers and to divide the church. What if we went into this next season saying nothing could break the peace that we have with others? That we're ready to seek after that no matter what divisions other people could try and bring about. But we are ready to bring peace into all circumstances. He continues in verse 16, the fourth weapon In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. 
In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all of the flaming darts of the evil one. The flaming darts of the evil one. This idea of taking up a shield and actually God being a shield for his people is a common one throughout the Old Testament. And so this fourth weapon is simply the weapon of faith that God gives us. The weapon of faith that God gives us collectively together that we stand in. There's so many instances throughout the Psalms that reference back to God being a shield for his people. I think of Psalm chapter 18 which says this, Psalm chapter 18, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. He's a shield to us. And this idea of having faith and standing firm to resist the devil also is seen in 1 Peter chapter 5, where we encourage to be sober-minded, to be watchful. Why? Because our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Seeking someone to devour, we resist him firm in our faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brothers throughout the world. Now, it is interesting, as, as I was thinking and, and researching this week on what they would have thought of when the, they in their time talked about a shield and being able to extinguish flaming darts was different than what I think we and certainly what I thought of this week when I thought of a shield of faith. Now, maybe this just shows my immaturity, right? But when I thought of a shield, this is what I thought of. Captain America. Yeah, I'm not the only one. Come on. Some of you were like, yeah, I confess. That was me too, all right? And the shield, right? The shield, which if you've seen any of the, the Marvel movies or the Avenger Captain America, the shield is a lot of different things, right? It's like this powerful thing and he can throw it and he chucks it and it kind of is all over the place. But he's the only one with the shield and he kind of is awesome because he has this really cool shield and he, he gets to run around and do all this cool stuff with it. But this kind of shield is not what the people back then would have thought of when they thought of soldiers standing with a shield. In fact, this is what, a picture of what they would have thought of, of Roman soldiers in a shield formation. Those in the front with it covering almost their entire bodies. And then to, to cover from the arrows, the darts of the enemy, they would stand together, those behind covering on top. So I'm saying that together, these, these soldiers armed with shields and side was one of the most difficult forces to break in all of the ancient world. Literally, historically, they say they would often dip their shields. They were often made of wood, but they, before battle, would dip them in water so that when the enemy shot flaming arrows at them, they would extinguish upon contact with the shields. Now, the shield, when they would have heard about a shield... They certainly wouldn't have thought of Captain America running around throwing things at people. But they would have thought not just of one person standing with the shield, but they would have thought of multiple soldiers standing side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and together they are strong because together they each hold up the shield of faith for not just themselves, but for the people next to them. See, one person with this shield is not too intimidating. Two, a little bit more. Three, yes, but a group of them together, that's what this image conveys. A reminder, we looked at this last week. If you remember, that he's giving these commands and these illustrations not in to a singular person, but plural. They're all to be practiced together. And this idea of taking up the shield of faith, not just something you fight on your own, but the shield of faith is a reminder that we fight and we stand in the spiritual battle together. We stand here and we walk alongside one another. And if you try and fight a spiritual battle on your own, you're fighting a losing battle. If you're trying to fight the spiritual battle on your own, you're fighting a losing battle. See, so much of, I think, the reason we, we miss out on this is just even how we talk so much about church in our world. See, if you were to go to work tomorrow and your friends asked you, hey, what did you do last night? You'd be like, yeah, well, I, I went to church. I went to church. That's just kind of how we talk. I went to church and then I left and I did this. And church, so often in how we talk about it and then it becomes in how we think about it, is like an event we go to. I went to a concert, I went to dinner, and I went to church. Well, you can go to a concert, you go to a dinner, but you belong 
to a church. You don't belong to a concert or belong to a restaurant, but you belong to the church. See, the church is not just an event that happens on Sunday. The church is the body of Christ, the group of believers banded together, walking together, arm in arm, side by side, holding up together the shield of faith in this world we live in. And if you think of church just as something to come to, which is good, part of being a part of a church is showing up. But, it, but church is more than just showing up and you're like, I'm not going to come until like seven minutes after because TK will like do that thing where I have to say hi to people. I don't want to do that. He does that all the time. So I'm going to come in like seven minutes after and then right after the last song, I'm going to leave so that way I can come in and out without talking to anyone. Some of you think that way. And I know that because that's how often how I think when I'm visiting churches in other places. That I don't want people to talk to me. I, don't, I, don't, I just want to get in and out. I just want to go to it. But the church is not just a thing to go to. It's the people to be a part of. And so don't just go to church, but be a part of the church. Dive into friendships and relationships. Join small groups. Stay afterwards. Talk to people. Come pray with someone. This is not the place that we want you just to come for an hour and leave. But it's the family, the community that we want you to be a part of. See, in spiritual attacks on our lives, Satan tries to isolate us. If Satan isolates us, we are not near as strong as when we stand side by side together. Passage continues in verse 16 and 17. It says this, And take up simply the helmet of salvation. The sixth weapon that God gives us is salvation. The sixth weapon that God gives us is salvation. We read this verse earlier, but it says it again in Isaiah chapter 59, 17, looking forward to the Messiah that was to come, that he puts the helmet of salvation on his head. And what Paul means to do in this passage is to emphasize again the power and the authority that we already have in Jesus Christ. The power and authority we have in Jesus. That it says in Ephesians chapter 2, that Jesus, in, in chapter 1, that Jesus was exalted far above all powers and principalities. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, that we are now seated in the heavenly places with Jesus. Because of the salvation that we have experienced, we're encouraged to look at the source of our salvation, who is Jesus Christ himself. See, in spiritual attack, it's often that we would even doubt our very own salvation. In spiritual attack, Satan would love it for us to wonder if we even are a follower of Jesus Christ. Which is why the helmet of salvation is so powerful when we understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to have salvation. When you go back just a few chapters before in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Not by works, but by grace you have been saved so that no one can boast. See, we can rest on our salvation as a weapon in warfare because it's not something we did to earn our salvation, but it's something we have that Jesus has given to us. And don't ever, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus, you can use salvation as a weapon because no matter what Satan can do to attack you, no matter what he can do to you, he cannot take your salvation from you. You can't lose your own salvation because you didn't earn it to begin with. It's a gift of God. It's grace to you. All that's required for your heart is belief. And so in spiritual attack, we can stand firm because we're relying not on our own efforts, but we're looking back to the work of Jesus Christ and that salvation doesn't come from our works, but from what Jesus has done for us. The last weapon he lists here in verse 17, says this, And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The sixth weapon that God gives us for spiritual warfare is the word of God of God, the word of God. This idea of scripture being a weapon like a sword is also seen in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, 
piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. See, the thinking of the, the role of the word of God, which means both the gospel and then the entire scriptures that we have. We think of the role that that plays in spiritual warfare as both a defensive and an offensive weapon that God gives us. First, when we, when we come under spiritual attack, one of the best ways to defend ourselves isn't through any clever sayings, through anything you've done, but to go back and what is God's word saying about it. When you come under attack to remind yourself and to turn to the truth that is revealed in God's word. This is exactly what Jesus did when he was tempted by Satan. Remember, Satan went and tempted Jesus. And what did every single time Jesus went back to scripture? Now, I don't know all of what it means to follow Jesus, but I know this. If Jesus thought it was so important that when tempted, he needed to go back to scripture, I think we do too. Right? If Jesus saw this as so important that in temptation and in spiritual attack that he went to scripture, I think it's true that we need to as well. And so scripture needs to be a regular part of our lives if we're fighting the spiritual battle that we have in our lives that God has given us. But he also is talking here throughout the book of Ephesians how the word of God is actually the weapon we use to advance the gospel throughout the world. How the sword is both a defensive weapon, but it's also an offensive weapon. And it's this idea that when we take ground in the realm of darkness, when people are freed from Satan's grasp, it's not due to our own strategies, our own imaginations, our own intelligence, but it's due to the power of the gospel and the word of God. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have been given weapons by God to fight this spiritual battle that we are in. It's not a battle that we are to fight ourselves, but we fight it alongside one another. In spiritual attack, often it comes to the very core of who we are, which is why so many of these things, the, these weapons that God gives us, go back to our standing of who we are in Jesus that we focus on the righteousness that God has given us, that we focus on the salvation that God has given us, not that we have earned. And so many of these weapons are weapons of greater and greater reliance upon God in every area of our lives. We are strong, it said in, the, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, we are strong in the strength of the Lord and in the power of his might. The weapons that God has given us aren't just weapons that we can use, but they're weapons that are given by him and we can use in his power. And so when we feel under attack in the world from various things, whether that's through circumstances, whether it's through people, whether you're just feeling attacked in your own spiritual life, use the weapons that God has given us. Remind yourself of the truth of God's word that you stand righteous before him, being ready to make peace with everyone else, standing side by side with one another in faith, knowing that your salvation comes from Jesus Christ alone. And in every opportunity that we have to look back and to rely on the word of God for power and for sustenance in this life. God, we thank you that you have given us all we need for life and godliness. God, I pray for anyone here, even tonight, who is undergoing some sort of spiritual attack in their lives. God, would we be quick to use the weapons that you have given to us, not to rely on our own efforts or our own power, but to rely on you, and that in the weak moments of our lives that you would be made strong, God, we, we pray that you would be with us this week as we go about. It's so easy to lose focus from these things. God, help us to daily rely on you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.